So we continue today. This is our, our last uh, set of concepts. And we've talked a lot about concentration effects. That's basically all that we talked about yesterday. Now we're getting into these last couple of factors. Um, and one of them is the idea of temperature. Now we've already rationalized to some degree that temperature is important in this process. After all, we know that temperature is going to increase that kinetic energy. And by virtue of the fact that the molecules are moving faster, they're gonna collide more often. And in those collisions, we're gonna get more likelihood, a greater chance of getting effective collisions, ones that have the proper energy and by sheer probability, the proper orientation. So we've already kind of rationalized that for ourselves. And we've already talked about this idea of activation energy, the minimum amount of energy it takes to get the reaction to go. Well, what we haven't talked about to this point is the idea that we have an equation that we can use that will more or less help us to figure out what that looks like and how to quantify it. It's called the Arrhenius equation. The Arrhenius equation looks like this. It is a relationship between K, the rate constant, and three other factors. Activation energy, Ea, temperature, T, and A, which is a statistical um, quantity called the collision frequency factor. Basically, it's that adjustment we make for the fact that all collisions are not necessarily successful collisions. And so it takes into account, okay, at a given temperature, we're going to see this extra number of collisions and this percentage of them are actually going to be good collisions. So this is the Arrhenius equation in its original form. And I think right away, most of us can see that there's a pretty big problem with the Arrhenius equation as it is written. For one, it doesn't do us any favors that we've got this exponential kind of term attached to it. If I try to graph this, if I try to do any kind of calculation with it, I'm gonna run into problems with that exponential containing a formula in it. It's gonna be really hard to get the right number there. If I try to put it into a calculator, unless I'm really diligent about using parentheses, there's a good chance I'm going to make mistakes on that as well. So like we saw with the integrated rates, there's a solution, a graphical solution. And that graphical solution involves, since we are dealing with the natural exponent here, the natural log. If we apply the natural log to both sides of that equation and using our rules of algebra and pre-calculus, we can take the Arrhenius equation and force it into slope intercept form by taking that natural log of the both sides. That gets rid of that natural exponent factor and it turns it into a form that we can use. Y 
is equal to M, which is EA over R, X, one over T, and the intercept is related to that frequency factor A. So right there, we've got it. Now the graph itself, I won't lie, the graph itself is kind of rude. Your X term is a reciprocal Kelvin temperature. So you gotta measure the temperature in Celsius, convert it to Kelvin, and then take the reciprocal of it in order to get it into the graphical form. And the K term is natural log as well. So if I try to interpret anything off of that graph, I have to understand the Y value has to have E to the Y to give us K. But it does present for us a graph, and that graph is linear. So if we conduct experiments at multiple temperatures and calculate multiple rate constants for those temperatures, we can use that graph to figure out the activation energy of the reaction, which would be related to the slope. Slope is equal to EA over R, negative EA over R. And we can get the collision frequency factor by taking E to the value of the y-intercept. So both of those are kind of useful to us. Now, if we only have a couple of temperatures, we can slow this down into this format here. The natural log of K1 over K2 is equal to the activation energy over R multiplied by one over T2 minus one over T1. Again, the thing to remember here is that T2 and T1 have to be in Kelvin. And the value of R here, we haven't talked about this R value much yet. Um, this is the uh, R value 8.314. Uh, which we will see many more times. It's joules per mole times Kelvin. When we get into thermodynamics later on in this term, this will be almost exclusively the value of R that we use. Up until this point, we've really only seen R used as a gas constant. So we've seen 62.36 if it's millimeters of mercury or tor. We've seen 0.0821 if it's atmospheres of pressure. Um, this one's technically expo uh, associated with uh, uh, kilopascals, but Again, we rarely ever use that term. Um, this one is most commonly associated with energy though. And so since we are dealing with activation energy in this problem, that is the source of that use. So let's go back here. And, and look at this again. So what this tells us, you know, coming, coming back to the original form, we can see that as we increase temperature, what we are seeing is that we are getting higher energy we're getting more molecules that are hitting that higher energy. And so when we increase the temperature, we get greater reaction. So this jagged line here represents that activation energy, that minimum energy for conversion. At the higher temperature, 
a greater fraction of the molecules hit that energy and a number of them will actually, more of them will actually react as a result. And that's why the reactions go faster when we up the temperature and why there is really no exception to that particular rule. You know, so much of what we talk about often is those exceptions and there really isn't one for this. So now we can see this is, this is called an Arrhenius plot. And we can see in the Arrhenius plot, we have plotted the natural log of K on the Y axis, the reciprocal temperature in Kelvin on the X, the slope of a Arrhenius plot is almost always exclusively negative. If it's not, that usually indicates some problem in the data. And that slope is equal to the opposite of activation energy over R, which means doing a little bit of quick algebra here, activation energy is equal to the negative slope times R. And if we keep that R value in our joule unit, 8.314 joules per mole K, we'll get an activation energy with a unit in joules as a result. All right, we got ourselves another example problem here. Here we have the decomposition um, of chlorine monoxide into chlorine gas and oxygen gas. We're asked to determine the activation energy and the frequency factor for this reaction. Now, all we have been given up until this point are Kelvin temperatures and rate constants. Now, right away, I should be able to look at this rate constant, completely unrelated, by the way. The fact that this rate constant is per molar per second tells us that it is a second order reaction. Just something to kind of chew on, things that you can easily recognize um, if you were asked to determine the rate law out of this. That's not the purpose of this particular exercise though. So we're gonna go back to Excel here. We need a temperature in Kelvin and a value of the rate constant in per molar per second. So let's get those values in real quick. Now, we don't even need to bother with plotting this, this graph as is. That's not what we're looking for. What we need is the X to be one over T. And the Y to be the natural log of K. Since our value of temperature is already in Kelvin, that makes it easy. And since our, net, our K value is there, we can grab that as well. This is the graph that we want to make.
So go to quick layout number nine. Got what we need. Now, if I was doing this for a grade, um, I would fix the axis here a little bit because there's absolutely no reason to um, include all of this white space over here. But we can see now we have a value. The graph has yielded for us y is equal to negative 1, 5, 7, 9, 0.8x. plus 27.994. Remember that slope is equal to negative EA over R. So negative 1579.8 is equal to negative EA over 8.314 joules per mole K. So if I multiply 1579.8 times 8.314, I get 13,130 joules per mole as my activation energy. The intercept is equal to the natural log of A. So 27.994 is equal to the natural log of A. Take E of both sides. Now cancel out the natural log. E to the 27.994 is 1.44 times 10 to the 12th as my frequency factor A. Frequency factor does not have a unit on it. So we just leave it just like that. Now for large values like this, it's not unheard of to convert that joules into kilojoules. So you might see that reflected as 13.13 kilojoules per mole instead of 13,130. It's just a decimal thing. Uh, don't, don't get too caught up into it. But that's, that's what you would need to do for a problem like this. This is how you use these kind of data points to calculate these Arrhenius values, like the activation energy, like the frequency factor. All right. Any questions?
Yes. So, so natural log of K was our Y, one over T was our X. And so, yes, you just set those up as formulas in Excel. Um, easiest way to go about it. Now, be forewarned, obviously on an exam or on a quiz, I'm not gonna be able to give you a question like this because you're not gonna have your laptop open in front of you to take said quiz. Um, you will see this in homework. You might see something along these lines on a homework assignment, on a quiz, on an exam. I give you the graph and say, tell me what this means. Or I give you another form of the Arrhenius equation to manipulate and you have to manipulate it. So like, for example, this one, the rate constant K for this reaction is 7.2 times 10 to the ninth per molar per second at 298 Kelvin. Activation energy is 12.8 kilojoules per mole. There's that kilojoules piece I was just talking about. What is the rate constant in the lower stratosphere where T is equal to 217 Kelvin? So in this case, we're not being asked about the frequency factor. We're not being asked about the activation energy it's been given to us we have been given a temperature condition and its rate constant and we want to know what is the rate constant at this other temperature condition so the equation that we have to use we have to go back a couple of slides the equation that we're going to have to use is this one The natural log of K1 over K2 is equal to EA over R times one over T2 minus one over T1. Now I wrote it on the board here, so I don't forget it when I have to copy it again on the next slide. Luckily for you, you're gonna be given an equation sheet and so you can just use the equation sheet um, when you need it to give you the starting point there. So K1 over K2, natural log, is equal to EA over R times one over T2 minus one over T1. Now we've been given all of the things that we need. I'm gonna give you a little hint here. Me personally, if I see that there is a variable in the denominator, I am probably twice as likely to make a mistake in the algebra later on than if that same variable is in the numerator. So the choice of T1, T2, K1, K2 is completely arbitrary. The only thing that you have to be is consistent. So if you assign 217 Kelvin as your T1, you better put that 217 Kelvin's rate constant as K1. Don't flip them around. Because one of two things will happen. Either you get an answer that doesn't make any sense, like the rate goes slower at a higher temperature, or you'll end up with like a negative temperature, which on the Kelvin scale also doesn't make any sense. So for that purpose, I am going to make this my T1, which means that this is going to be my K2 and this is going to be my K1. 
or excuse me, my T2. See, already confusing myself. Okay, so natural log of K1, we're leaving that one alone. K2 is 7.2 times 10 to the ninth per molar per second. Activation energy is 12.8 kilojoules per mole. R is 8.314 joules per mole K. So if I put that 12.8 kilojoules in here, notice right away, I've got a mismatch. I am dividing kilojoules in the numerator by joules in the denominator. Can't have that. Not going to work. So you need to convert one of them to the units of the other. Again, going off of me personally here, a lot easier to multiply than divide, at least in my eyes. So 12.8 kilojoules is 12,800 joules per mole. T2 is 298 Kelvin. T1 is 217 Kelvin. If I look at all the units here, the joules are going to cancel. The moles are going to cancel. The one over one over Kelvin will cancel after we do the subtraction. So after all of the math is done on the right side of this equation, all I'm going to be left with is a number. So again, personal preference here. I'm going to do the subtraction in those parentheses first, not just because I'm a stickler for the order of operations, but more because I don't want to make a mistake and accidentally do some weird distribution thing and get the wrong answer as a result. So one over 298 minus one over 217. That gives me a negative decimal. I'm gonna multiply that by 12,800 and divide that by 8.314. After all of that, I'm gonna get negative 1.2. After all that, I'm going to get negative 1.93. Again, that number is unitless because all the units have canceled out. So now I've got the natural log of this fraction is equal to negative 1.93. Next step is to get rid of the natural log. So I'm going to raise each side by the natural exponent. That's going to get rid of the natural log. And so we will end up with K1 over 7.2 times 10 to the ninth per molar per second is equal to uh, 0.145. Now all I need to do is multiply by K2 on both sides. 
I get K1 is equal to one point zero times ten to the ninth per molar per second. Now, again, we, we, we have to contextualize this for ourselves. Does this number make sense? And the only context that we have is that it is at a cooler temperature. So it should go slower. Its rate constant should be smaller. And indeed it is. That's really the only context that we have for knowing if we did the process correctly. Now, we could have made some sort of tiny math mistake along the way as well. That's a little bit harder to detect. But if the number doesn't make sense contextually, then we know that we made some kind of serious mistake and we need to fix it. We need to go back and make sure that we have aligned everything properly. All right, any questions about the Arrhenius equations or kind of what we're using them for, how to use them. All right, then that's break.